All right, we'll get started. Uh, my name's Dan Clark. Uh, I'm from the States, uh, near, uh, near Philadelphia. Anybody been over there? Been to Philadelphia? No. You don't know anything about it. It's a great place to visit, though. And uh, the, uh, I work for Pragmatic Works. Uh, we uh, do BI consulting. Has anybody ever heard of Pragmatic Works? Okay. We don't do uh, a lot uh, over, over here. We do a lot in the States. Uh, we do have, uh, you should check out our website sometime, uh, pragmaticworks.com. We have uh, training on the T's, free training. So we would, uh, and that's, so it would be our lunchtime, which would be, you know, five o'clock your time, something like that. Uh, and uh, we do a lot of train, free training on uh, SQL Server, uh, database stuff, and BI stuff. So um, basically what we are is a, is a Microsoft shop uh, uh, for that. Now, one of the things we're doing, though, is we're finding out that uh, there's a tremendous push out there for uh, integrating, uh, you know, traditional SQL Server type of data stuff or Oracle database, relational databases with uh, big data sources. So uh, this is actually going to be heating up, uh, really getting hot in the next couple of years. So uh, if you're in BI, you're going to see big data. You're going to have to touch this stuff one way or another. And so, uh, even in uh, uh, Microsoft, they're doing a lot of uh, uh, connections uh, that they're uh, allowing connections between their SQL Server database and a big data structure. Parallel data warehousing. Has anybody ever heard of that? Anybody? Yeah. You guys got to talk to me. Man. <laughs> uh, so, with parallel data warehousing, that's their answer to massive amounts of data. But that's also in a relational uh, SQL Server database, whereas uh, the new versions of the Parallel Data Warehouse appliance are going to actually have a Hadoop instance and a SQL Server database, Parallel Data Warehouse database in the same box. So you can talk back and forth and merge the data and so forth. So uh, it's, it's uh, an interesting space and uh, it's going to be around for a while. Uh, just to, how many of you have, uh, are brand new to Hadoop and big data and all that? Okay, good. Um, and was anybody at my talk yesterday? Just a couple of you, so that's not good. <laughs> Supposed to raise more hands than that, make me feel better. Uh, so those people we talked about uh, yesterday, we were talking about MapReduce and uh, uh, you know, the nitty-gritty, when you first started this stuff, uh, you would have to write the map reduce uh, to end up, uh, you know, processing the data. Well, uh, again, in the infancy, uh, that's okay, but we want to do be productive, right? So to be productive, you're not going to write map, uh, map reduce for everything you do. Uh, it's just impractical. So. What has to happen is there has to be some sort of a language, a querying language that would allow you to get the data out in something you're familiar with and uh, in order to, uh, it would take care of it, some sort of engine that would take care of writing the actual map produce or interpreting the, the language into a map produce program that can be executed. Okay, and that's what we're gonna talk about today uh, is looking at Hive and Hive HQL. Now, if you guys have any questions on it, uh, uh, just check your cell phones in case anybody has any, you know, loud ringtones. <laughs> so uh, uh, just put it on uh, vibrate or whatever. And so um, one of the things that I think you should have is a little bit of a background into the Hadoop ecosystem. So we're going to review that very quickly. Uh, some of you, we reviewed that yesterday in a big old uh, review. Uh, using the Hadoop Sandbox, so I'm going to show you the actual uh, Hadoop Sandbox that I like to use to practice on this stuff and get up in speed. And, and it's a really good, great learning environment to do this. Uh, you're going to have uh, Hive Pig and H Catalog. So 
Hive and H catalog are connected. Uh, we have both two ways you can process your data here. We have Hive, which is more of a SQL server or SQL-like uh, language, and you have Pig, which is more of a scripting-like language. Originally, uh, about a year ago, to uh, about a year ago, you could do more in Pig than you could in Hive. Uh, so it was still you had to pretty much know both. Now they're pretty parallel. So they have uh, introduced a lot of the stuff that you couldn't do in, in version one of Hive, uh, HQL, that you now you can do. So they're they're bringing the two languages so that they're uh, comparatively the same. So it's just the way you like to work. If you like to work in a scripting language, then you can use Pig. If you like to work in a uh, querying language, then you would end up using uh, a Hive. We're going to take a look at some basic querying with Hive and some advanced querying with Hive, and then um, extending Hive. So what can you do if uh, out of the box it doesn't have what you want? You can still extend the Hive and write your own script files and uh, you can also write your own uh, a map reduce job and call them from uh, Hive if you want to. So at one point you may not do it, but you might say, okay, uh, we have a guy in our uh, department, uh, you know, I'm just the HQL guy, but I know what I need. I'm going to tell him I need this particular map reduce job. He can set it up for me and then I can use that in, in the Hive. All right. So you ought to just remember what I'm showing you is the possibilities that you have. Obviously, you're not going to learn, you know, ingrain all this in, in one uh, session, but uh, be open to the possibilities that's out there, and then you can go back and research it and so forth. All right. And uh, again, if you have any questions, just go ahead and ask. Uh, don't save them to the end. <laughs> just go ahead and ask them. So the Hadoop ecosystem, uh, what you're going to have in, in Hadoop, uh, what do you guys know about Hadoop? Do you know anything about it? Somebody give me a, what basically is Hadoop? It's HDFS system. Yeah. HDFS system. So HDFS system, which is what? Hardware box is distributed across multiple yes. hardware or hardware sources. Let's call it that. Yeah. So, the answer, the, 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 um, what did it solve, I guess, is, is uh, if you have massive amounts of data and you want to process through this massive amounts of data that we're having, uh, traditional relational database methods are just couldn't keep up with it. Okay, so uh, how do we look at it? Well, we look at it, well, we're going to parallel process stuff. You're going to parallel process it on these uh, nodes, these data nodes, and you could put them out on cheap hardware uh, and basically instead of bringing the data to the processing we're going to take the processing and distribute it to the data. Okay, so we're going to move it out there on each of the, on the nodes. Um, and uh, this originated, does anybody know where this originated? Where did this technology originate? Yeah, Yahoo. Uh, big search engines, uh, that kind of thing, where they're doing a lot of searching through uh, uh, web data uh, and stuff like that. So uh, the the traditional stuff uh, that was out there, they they couldn't use. So they had to roll their own, and so through this of uh, uh, rolling their own uh, types of uh, frameworks and so forth, uh, they released it into open source, and then uh, Apache. Uh, is the one that uh, is kind of, you know, uh, packaging it and putting it out for everybody. So, <clears throat> originally this was all non-Microsoft technologies, and then uh, the um, HD uh, Insight came along. So HD Insight is what? My hear of HD Insight? CSU. CSU, any? What's that? C distribution of Hadoop on Azure? Yeah, so uh, uh, Microsoft HD Insight is their distribution of, of the, uh, uh, the ecosystem. And they partnered with a uh, firm called uh, Hortonworks. So if you 
uh, and that's who has that sandbox. So Hortonworks is doing a lot for this. They have HD uh, for Windows. And if you go up and you look at it, if you download it and install the uh, the uh, simulator that you can use to, to practice on everything, under the scenes it's just uh, a Hadoop packaged to use the Microsoft uh, uh, file system uh, that they have up on HDN7. So it's just a, basically the same stuff, just packaged. So it's not rewritten in anything, it's still Java based and so forth. All right. Now, the thing with it is you have a lot of pieces that have to work together here. So it's not one complete system, but a bunch of different frameworks and different systems that are, are uh, you know, uh, distributed together. And so uh, if we look here, the, the lowest section here we have is the HDFS, which is the distributed storage. Uh, and then it's going to uh, keep these uh, remember, everything here is unstructured, so if you're talking about it, what it's keeping it in, what kind of a... How do we keep the data in the HDFS? Is that unnormalized? It's not normalized in any format. Well, it's not even... It's, yes, even below that, it's just in files, right? So it's file-based, so you just have a bunch of text files out there uh, that are, are going to be distributed uh, across there. And then uh, you have this uh, distributed processing, which is the MapReduce, and there's a new one called Yarn that they're bringing up. Uh, so uh, they're adding some feature sets to it and make it a little bit more uh, efficient uh, and so forth. So basically, uh, what a MapReduce does, what's, what does a MapReduce do? People over there, here you guys. I thought it was just. Splits processing. What's that? The splits processing job is multiple uh, matches. Okay, so the, the first thing is the map, which uh, takes the, uh, the the raw data and sets it up so that uh, it's going to be in key value pairs. Okay, so it's going to take the map, take it up, and it's going to be input is text files, row by row. Output is text files, key value pair, okay? So then the reduce says, okay, we're gonna have all these key value pairs, and what does reduce say to you? So it just combines them into one? Yeah, combine it all of using some sort of aggregation type thing, right? So you might wanna know uh, what's the count of, uh, you know, the count of um, hits on a particular website, uh, or something like that, you would do a, a map job which would uh, map it out into the hits, key value pairs, and then the reduce would, would uh, aggregate all that up. All right. You can have map jobs without a reduce job. So a map job without a reduce job is going to be just something like uh, uh, get the, parse out the hour from this particular date function, right? So it's just doing a parse on each of the, of the line by line in, but it's not doing any kind of reducing. You're not aggregating it. Okay? You can't have a reduce job without a map job box. That make sense? So basically, everything boils down to map reduce. So in the beginning, like I said, you had to write those map reduce jobs, and you had to write those map reduce jobs in, in Java code. Now, uh, we can also write MapReduce jobs in C Sharp code, which is what we did yesterday. Uh, and so, if you have some kind of processing that's not out of the box, uh, you have some uh, option on so on how you want to end up uh, writing those MapReduce jobs. But for the most part, 95% of your queries, you're going to be able to use uh, one of these languages. So here, in between these languages, we have the H catalog, which is the metadata services. So what does the metadata services do? What do you think it does? Got a feeling. Scrolls the data. What's that? Scrolls the data. Yeah, so the metadata services, we have to have, if we're going to have some kind of a line querying language, right, we have to add some kind of structure to it. Okay, so we have all this unstructured data that we're in there, and then we're going to put structure on top of it 
so that we can uh, end up doing some kind of a querying into it. Does that make sense? Now the difference is, in a relational database, you define the structure first, conform the data to the structure. Here, we have data unstructured, and then we're going to define our structure on top of the data. So the structure is, can change. You can have the same data with three or four different structures on it, depending upon what your needs are. All right, so this time it's data first, then the structure, then the query, as opposed to structured data query. All right. So once we define the structure on here, which is actually going to be, remember, it's not actual structure, it's just kind of, you know, it's, it's the pseudo structure. Uh, so uh, to us, this isn't a table, we're going to define a table to hold the data. But in reality, where's the data held? In a file somewhere. Okay, so it's going to hide that complexity to us. We don't have to care where the file, where the data actually resides. Uh, we can just go ahead and, and work with it with the table. And then once you have the metadata services described, then you can do your scripting with pig or your querying uh, with hot. Now the nice thing is, the same metadata services feeds both of them. So if you're talking about a table in high query and you want to go ahead and do a scripting on it, it's the same structure that you use on it. So it's very similar. Uh, and then we have uh, things like uh, workflow scheduling. It's, you can set these up in workflows. Uh, management and monitoring services so you can see how your jobs are running and so forth. Uh, and then over here, which is kind of important, is uh, we're doing all this querying with Hive and so forth. Eventually, what do we want to do with the data? We got to pull it out to some sort of client, right? Because we want to do some kind of uh, reporting and probably some kind of a BI analysis type thing. So we want to move it out into some kind of a client. Right. Well, the way you move it out into some kind of a client, be it Power View, be it Power uh, Query, be it uh, um, what's another non-Microsoft Informatica. There we go. <laughs> I don't want to just go on Microsoft. Uh, uh, any of that, uh, we're going to actually have to uh, send it out through these APIs. The nice thing is that there's an ODBC driver for that. So there's an ODBC driver for Hive, there's a JDBC driver for Hive. All right, so uh, definitely uh, have structured this into stuff that you're used to using. Okay, so I just go, let's see, we're gonna lose through here. Um, just wanna emphasize this is for large data sets, not for small data sets, okay. Uh, it's going to be latent. Remember that uh, these queries uh, are not going to be the type of queries that you sit there, do the query, and have it come back like that. All right. My queries are going to be fairly fast because my data sets aren't that far. But uh, it could take, uh, if you do a query, and it's a huge data set, it could take five minutes, it could take ten minutes. So uh, this is going to be definitely something that's going to be batch done, that kind of thing, not actually journal and trying to get those answers quickly. Now, what you do is you'll do the queries or batch run them at night, feed them into uh, staging tables, and then those staging tables can feed client applications. Okay. Make sense? So this is not a replacement for relational databases. Um, the nice thing is everything is uh, handled for you uh, whereas as far as the plumbing code and everything so we have these name nodes you don't really have to know much about this but they maintain the directories and files manage the blocks uh, that are present and then the data nodes are the slaves uh, they're deployed in each machine provide the actual uh, storage and serve up the read and request uh, that kind of thing 
Uh, and then there's some resource uh, managers that take care of you. One of them is uh, you got to manage this map reduce process. So uh, this yarn resource manager does that, arbitrates the uh, resources among all the applications, uh, and negotiates resources, and then works with the nodes. And then the node manager manages the individual com uh, compute nodes, and then lifecycle management. And then you have a job history server, so you can go back and look at the history of these things. Okay, but basically what you're looking at there is not too deep. We have to manage uh, where the data is, so we know where the data is located on these different nodes. We have to manage, remember this distributes the actual code out to those nodes, runs it locally, and then you have to manage the compilation of all that. Okay, so that's all done for it. And this is some of the different uh, systems that, that do that. Okay, so we have uh, the uh, HBase is a non-relational database. Uh, so it's a, uh, it basically, this is how things are stored in there. It's a columnar, uh, fault tolerant storage. Uh, when we say columnar, what's, uh, what's that? Opposed to a relation or a row base. Am I not? What's that? Just perfectly organized, no rows. Yeah, so everything is uh, in a column, and then to, to bring the row back, it goes in and takes it from the different columns. Okay, so the, the big thing there is uh, that and what does it say? Indexing. Where we're. we're yeah, indexing. Oh. Uh, so you're going to have indexes. Still, you can have indexes on these, uh, but what's it save is the uh, uh, space. Okay. So if we look at that, if everything's in a column, how many times are we going to repeat things? Yeah, it's data compression. We only repeat it, you know, everything's just one time, right? So you can get huge amounts of data compression. Uh, now they have uh, um, ways of getting this out that's actually very quick to get it out. And uh, this is actually, they're all going to this columnar and stuff. So SQL Server 2014 is heavily based on columnar type of storage. Uh, and how many of you play with Power Pivot? Nobody? Ah, oh, come on. <laughs> I'm writing a book on that. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, that's good. So, anyhow, Power Pivot is, uh, uh, brings in massive amounts of data into a uh, Excel uh, system, type of system, but the way they can do it is it's a columnar database. And the nice thing with all this compression is we can pull things up in memory, so you never, you, you're working with all your data in memory. So you get it very quickly, okay? Look into Power Pivot. So, about the time you're ready to learn it, my book will be done. So anyhow, the uh, H-Catalog Metadata Service, uh, again, uh, has the abstraction layer for referencing the data without using the underlying file names or formats. You don't have to worry about that. It has uh, REST APIs uh, so that we can uh, program uh, go in there and pull it out if we want. So I can write a C-sharp program that uh, goes in and, uh, and pulls out the metadata, that kind of thing. Talked about this, PIG is a scripting platform. Uh, so, uh, uses a texture, I actually like this, this i got to mention this, so it uses a textual language called Pig Latin. Mm -hmm. Okay, one thing I like about open source is they have a sense of humor, so you look at some of these names that they're, they're giving, the zookeeper and all this stuff, it's, uh, it's pretty fun, so uh, I do like that. Uh, and then uh, Hive Data Access and Query, uh, easy data uh, for aggregation, ad hoc queries. Uh, and analysis of very large data sets. Uh, query the data using SQL-like language, which is really the key to it because most people know how to do uh, SQL-like language. 
uh, query engine converts it to a MapReduce code. So much like uh, SQL Server, right? SQL Server has a query engine underneath it, so it, it turns that uh, query that you write into a query plan, which is a, a proprietary type of way of getting the data out. So you depend upon the query engine to be efficient at pulling this out. So one of the problems there is you have no control over it, right? So the, the, if they write a good query plan or query engine, uh, then things are fine. And they're actually uh, improving the query engine all the time in this as they release it. And it actually uh, runs very quickly and, and does, does nice stuff. If you wanted to bypass that query engine, what would you have to do? Let's, yeah, right, to map reduce yourself. So you do have that option, unlike SQL, uh, you know, unlike a, a SQL Server or Oracle or something like that, you actually have the option here to actually write the the bits that would actually, you know, go in and bypass all this stuff if you had to. And that's the nice thing about it. Uh, so, but for most of us, we are not going to do that. Uh, and so you're going to say, okay, write a good query engine to do it, and they're doing that. Um, service maintain scanning. Just some of the other services there. We don't really need to go into this. Okay, so uh, what's Microsoft's big data solution? So uh, I'm assuming that most of your Microsoft shops being at this place. <laughs> so the uh, Hortonworks data platform uh, is. Uh, one of the, uh, it's, a, it's the HTDP2 for Windows. So if you're going to host this yourself on your own site, or on your own Windows servers, this is what you would use. All right. If you're going to uh, end up uh, doing it in the cloud, how many of you are working in the cloud right now? Two of you? Okay. Um, whether you like it or not, you're going to be probably pushed to the cloud within the next five years. Uh, so uh, you should start looking into some of this cloud-based stuff. But HD Insight in the cloud uh, is, is the other version here. So all you do is you hook up, you go up to you know, Microsoft, you get an account, and then it looks exactly the same. So if you were going to work with it on-premises or you're going to work with it in a cloud, it looks the same. The only thing that's different is where it's located. All right. Uh, and then they have this parallel data warehouse. Uh, that's getting real hot uh, right now, too. The problem with that is it's a very expensive. So unless you're a large shop, you're probably not going to do that. Although they're, they're working on getting uh, a cloud-based parallel data warehousing system that you can buy in. Uh, the, the interesting thing here I wanted to point out is uh, they have this polybase now, which is the, the integrated query between structured and unstructured data. And so you're going to see in the future, uh, it's all about data anywhere, any place. You know, you just want to combine the data. And so there's ways to do this. This is going to make it into a natural uh, query language where you can say, select, uh, you know, from this table in SQL Server. Uh, join this table in my Hadoop cluster and bring it back as one query. Okay, it's not quite there yet, but that's what they're going for, the merging of those two. So you can do integrated query across different things. So uh, look for that. Uh, and then Power BI uh, used to uh, analyze and visualize both the structured and unstructured data. And this is really something they're, they're pulling into. So they have this uh, uh, Excel is starting to have be the, uh, the hub for all your power, your, your BI analysis. You can bring things in from any, any type of data structure. So you can bring it in from a Hadoop cluster. You can uh, bring it in from a SQL. You can bring it in from the web, whatever. Combine them into the same data model, OK? And so you can have one data model with many different sources, which is nice. Developer tools, question mark. 
There are, really are none in the Microsoft space right now. So what I want to see is some kind of Visual Studio integration uh, to make this so that I can use my favorite IDE, you know, and all the bells and whistles and, 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 and all that to, uh, to make this easier. Right now, if you're going to do it uh, in Visual Studio, uh, I mean, excuse me, in uh, the Microsoft uh, HD Insight, you're using a lot of uh, command line type of thing. Okay, and I'm not a big fan of command line. <laughs> Productivity just isn't there. So, one of the things I do like though is if I'm going to learn it, even if I'm learning it for to use on the command line, you're going to you're going to end up learning Hive, right? Hive HQ. Okay. Uh, QL. So there's a HTTP uh, sandbox out on uh, Horton Works. So you want to remember that Horton Works, and this is by far the best learning environment for this. So let's go ahead and take a look at. Yeah, it did that For some reason, when I switch over, it uh, extends my display instead of duplicating it. I don't know what's going on. But anyhow, if I come in and I look at uh, one of the things you download is you can download a uh, virtual box. So what they do is Hortonworks. Uh, you want to go out to Hortonworks, out at Hortonworks there's a sandbox that's 2.0 2 is the version now uh, and it just comes down as a, as a file, uh, everything's packaged together and there's actually a, a, like a couple different technologies for doing this virtual box so uh, I'm just happened to pick the Oracle uh, virtual management box because uh, I've been using it for a while and it works. Uh, but there's others out there too if, if you want to uh, load those. So once you have that set up, really all you got to do is start the box. Okay, so you're going to see it go through there, and as you look at it going through there, you're going to notice uh, it's doing some test things, and then it's uh, going to start uh, loading up all these uh, services. And these are all the services that I talked about before. Okay, so it has to have all those services on the box up and running so that they can uh, give you the solution. Uh, to do that. So if you uh, look at it, uh, <coughs> it should be up soon. It not take that long. So notice it started the name nodes, the data nodes, Uzi, uh, Zookeeper, uh, and then Hive and Hive Server 2. So the nice thing about this is it's all packaged, it just works, so you don't have to worry about setting it up on your machine and getting, it can be a real hassle to set up uh, all this from scratch. Um, so any, there we go, start in the sandbox. Okay, so now it's all good. So if you want to log on, 
So what this is actually doing is this is setting up a virtual box. It's actually Linux based. So if you wanted to, if you knew Linux, you can actually go in there and start playing around, seeing where everything's located and that kind of thing. Um, but you really don't have to get into that box at all because now that that's up and running, what you do is you just hook into it using a browser. Now one of the things I've found is that on my, I usually use IE for everything else, but uh, it turns out that Chrome, uh, Google Chrome is probably the best browser to, to work with the sandbox. And so I just go ahead and click on the sandbox. And, and now we have the Hortonworks sandbox. So notice the other thing I like about this is there are actually, you can start to tutorials in there. So there's tutorials you can do to learn uh, some of the stuff on how to use the HQ, uh, SQL, uh, the Hive, QL, PIG, all that stuff. Uh, so you can start the tutorials. If you want to learn more, uh, there's a, a video out there and so forth so you can actually find these online. We're just going to actually go to the sandbox. And so now you'll notice in the sandbox here, uh, we have a bunch of different tools available to us. So if I look across the top here, I have Beeswax, which is going to be a Hive user interface. So we can use that. Here's my pig, if I needed to use pig. Here's H catalog. Okay. Here's the file browser, so I can use that to go up. And here's a job browser if I want to look at all the jobs that are running on there. Job designer. Uh, Uzi editor if you wanted to work with Uzi and scheduling. Uh, and then there's the shells too. So if I look at the Hue shell, you, you notice I have the pig shell, the HBase shell, and, and uh, I guess the batch, which I'm not sure what that is. So <laughs> the, the uh, if if you were going to do this, this is like I, I said, if you were going to do this in uh, without the sandbox, you would actually have to use these shells command lines and type it in doing it that way, which so you could still test it in here if you wanted to, but by far what I'm going to do is uh, you'd probably use, uh, the, in this case, the hive, the beeswax. So there's a query editor and, and so forth in here. All right, so that's getting this up and launched. So now, so the first thing we want to do is load data files. Okay, so in HDFS, there's Hadoop file system commands that you can use. Okay, so file system would be uh, copy from local and all that stuff. So there's command lines. Uh, I'm going to show you the file browser, the Hue uh, file browser, uh, which, which will allow you to do it a lot easier, but it's still going to use the command lines behind the scenes. And then uh, supports file compression. This is one thing I wanted to point out. So HDFS, you can uh, load these in, in, uh, and keep the files compressed. There's a couple of different uh, compression codecs that they uh, actually support. So there's more than just the gzip. Uh, and then HD Insight, uh, there's actually, uh, uh, usually you're going to use the Windows Azure PowerShell uh, and use that to end up moving uh, files back and forth. Uh, on uh, on the HD inside, uh, it actually hosts and, and uses a different uh, storage structure than the HDFS uh, uh, Hadoop system. So it's the Windows Azure blob storage. That's the only thing you really need to know. It's a little bit different structure. That's all. Uh, and they're starting to make the tooling in this is is starting to pick up. So uh, there is an Azure Storage Explorer. That's put out, uh, and there's also an HDFS Explorer uh, 
So uh, if you look at some of these, uh, one is uh, Redgate puts out the HDFS Explorer, the Azure Storage Explorer, I forget who puts that out, but it's some um, third party and it's a free, uh, free uh, source out there. So after you do it a couple times on the command line, you're probably going to start searching for helper things to make this a little easier. Okay, so once we get the files up there, then we want to uh, create the tables. So what we want to do is use hcatalog to uh, create the tables. And so uh, the command line interface uh, you know, using PowerShell uh, on HD Insight uh, or the hcatalog interface that uses Hive DBL statements. Uh, so uh, you can you create table and all that stuff. The Hugh H catalog interface, create table from files, kind of nice. So if you have a file out there, it automatically create it from the file. Uh, you can create uh, it's the database table uh, abstraction layer, and you can share the abstraction between tools. Like I said, you can use the same abstraction in Pig and Hive. It supports views, indexing, and partitioning. So a lot of things that you that you're used to. So the statements are, uh, again, going to be pretty similar to what you're seeing. Uh, create table. So in this particular case, I'm creating a table and I'm saying, okay, sensor storage. And so we're looking at uh, the different uh, columns in there. So we have uh, strings, we have uh, ints, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and you're going to see row format delimited fields terminated by a, uh, a comma. So this is going to be basically probably pulling in a CSV file. Okay. And so create index. So you can have indexes on these. So notice on this table sensor, uh, it's going to create the index just like uh, with the uh, deferred rebuild. Okay, so don't build it until after it's been loaded. Uh, the uh, building uh, ID is what we're creating the uh, index on. And again, why would you create an index on the building ID? Query 101. Somebody from the back row. What's that? Yeah, you're probably going to pull uh, things out based on the building ID. So if you're pulling things out based on the building ID, create an index on it, right? If you're going to do a table join, uh, create an index on it, that kind of thing. Okay, so uh, uh, partitions, we can have partitioning. <coughs> so in this particular case, we're going to say partition by uh, string, uh, the date, and the country. And then uh, you can even go further and do clustering. Uh, okay, so you can cluster by user ID and then sort by uh, view time into 32 buckets. Okay, so why would we want to use like partitioning and bucketing and that kind of thing? What's up? So you can spread the files out multiple machines, is that right? Yeah, so you're going to spread the files around and basically. Uh, the 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 purpose is uh, more uh, how you're going to bring it back. So what you're expecting to bring back is bring it back by. Uh, so you're going to do a where clause where uh, date equals whatever date, where country equals whatever whatever country. Uh, and so if it has if if you do limit it that way, what's going to how many buckets is it going to have to look into? Or how many partitions, I should say. Two? Uh, actually, one. Right? One, because we're partitioning by both of them. So, what you're going to have is you're going to have uh, a partition that's just set up with UK, you know, country, uh, and 1 uh, 1 2014. All right? So, 
remember, we're doing this because we have huge amounts of data. Okay, so we want to set these petitions up so that when we pull it out, uh, we don't have to go across all that data structure. We can just pull it out from that particular partition. And then we can even narrow it down to uh, buckets. So you can go in and say, okay, I want to go in this partition, this bucket. All right. So. So excuse me, is view time, is that a system thing or is that part of the data? Uh, view time is part of the data. Yeah. So what I'm looking at there is uh, taking and, and looking at uh, maybe um, data from a, uh, a web server, and I'm looking at uh, what uh, what was the date, what was the view time, who was the user ID that looked at it, you know that kind of thing. So, okay. so it's not part of the table; it's part of the file. Yeah, it's part of the file. Okay. So, yeah, it's not a, uh, part of the table structure that we, we put up. Just for a quick question, right? These, these tables indexes, these are metadata over the top of the file system, right? Right. right so, how do these partitions and indexes and so on affect the physical storage of the files? Do they affect where the files are located at all? Yeah, they, these, if you partition by them, uh, you'll, you will have, uh, it will affect some of the physical storage uh, that's going on underneath. Right. Yeah. There's so so if you wanted to tune it this way, uh, you got to make sure that your queries are coming in kind of this way. Right. Any other questions? Okay, so then to load the data, so once we have the table structured up there, we're going to load the data. And so uh, one of the things we're going to do here is we're going to do uh, uh, things like you can do it from page view staging, uh, insert overwrite table, so uh, a lot of things that you're used to uh, working with, insert overwrite table, page view, partition, uh, in this case, we're going to actually go ahead and load a particular partition in the table, so we know that, that the staging table is going to run in and load that. And so we're going to select statement, and we're going to say uh, uh, where our country equals U.S. So uh, again, limiting what's loaded into that particular partition, doing an overwrite. You can also load uh, doing a load data. So we have load data from impact, and so this goes and takes it from actually a text file uh, and into uh, page view, and and then uh, partitioning it that way too. So there's uh, when you're loading the data, you can load it from uh, staging tables in uh, to other tables. You can also load it from uh, text files. Yeah, that's a limited amount of sense to me as a SQL. So, you told it to load into the partition called 2008 Right. Does it care what's in the data? Or is it only going to load what matches that partition from the data? All right. I have to make sure that the data is going to right. so conform to that. Right. Given it, you should in that partition regardless of what's in there. Right. Yeah. So, you got to make sure that my select. So, first of all, I know in my staging table it's only going to be this particular date. And then I'm uh, using my select to limit it to a particular country. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't inherently know uh, on the load. You can't just throw in a whole big table and say you do it yourself. You have to actually load it and stage it. So, yeah, good. Any other questions? Okay. So let's take a look at creating and uh, loading some of this data.
So over here we have the uh, file browser. So if I look at the file browser, you're going to notice here that I have uh, different files that are already out there. So I have this HVAC, CSV file, flight performance, uh, CSV file, and here's one uh, TSV file and it's uh, compressed. Uh, so these are the different files that, uh, for example, I would upload in here. So if you look at the upload, here I can uh, upload a file, I can upload a zip file if I wanted to. So this is kind of nice. So go to files and then select files to upload. I don't know what that was. Gives me the well. <laughs> So, let's see. Okay, so if I wanted to, for example, uh, look at the uh, I use that report. Here's a CSV file, US Airports. And so it's going to be uploading that. So what, you, what ends up happening there is it taking it from my local file system and uploading that into the HDFS system. Okay. So now if I look at that US Airports, I can actually go ahead and uh, view that. And you'll notice that I have code the airport code, the name, the country, latitude, longitude, that kind of thing. Alright. So there's the actual data that, that is being uploaded in there. Make sense? So now, if I take a look and I have the data there, so now what I want to do is create a table for that. So if I go to HCAT, and you'll notice now I have some uh, different tables that I have already structured in there. So if I would say, okay, let's look at uh, the HVAC. There's uh, the actual the uh, HVAC table I have in there. You'll notice that it has the uh, temperature is one of the columns, and so here are all the different columns in there. And here's my different data types that I have, and you can add comments there too if you want. And you'll notice here I have actions for uh, I can uh, say okay, import the data. I can uh, browse the data, uh, or I can drop the table and that kind of thing. So if I browse the data, you'll notice now I'm, I'm browsing the data structured in that table structure that I'm doing. <coughs> All right. So if I come back to uh, tables, and I want to create a new table. Now let's say I'm going to create a new table from the file. Okay, so I'm going to call this uh, table name uh, Airports, and I'm going to choose a file. And now, notice as I choose the file, I have that U.S. Airports CSV. So I can just go ahead and choose that. And now, if you'll notice, uh, it, it pulls in some things that we can say. Okay, what's the delimiter? So in this particular case, it's a comma. And so things like read column headers. Uh, so if you notice, it actually read the column headers as it uh, brought it in there. Do I want to import the data after I make the table? So you can actually tell it to import the data now or wait. Okay. And so in this particular case, I'm going to say column name is code. It's a string type. Name is a string. Country is a string. Notice latitude is a double. And the longitude is a double. All right. And then it gives me the different uh, values as it goes in there. So is this what you want? And it looks good to me. Let's 
somewhere. There it is. Create the table. So behind the scenes, what's going on? What is it doing? It's just creating all that uh, command line stuff and sending it in. Okay, so you can either do this using the command line if you want. So again, it's just like when you're in SQL Management Studio, uh, you can uh, you could actually write the T SQL code to do it. Here we could write the H catalog, uh, you know, code command line code to do it, or you could let some kind of interface do it for you. So just to, you know, this is importing data to the table. Is it physically creating a separate? Sort of store a table. They're pulling data from the file into. I thought this was just saying that metadata that made the file look like a table. Well, it's pulling in, you know, structures and pointers and so forth. Yeah. Okay. So uh, it is setting up uh, the metadata structure for pulling the data in over top of the layer. Right. Okay. So as far as uh, uh, loading the data, it is loading, you know, it's sort of loading the data. So if we, if we went in and changed the content of that underlying file, would that be, then be represented when we browse the data here? Um, that's a good question. Uh, it should uh, you would have to actually load it again, I, I believe. So if you change the, uh, and I know what you're getting at, so is it uh, actually uh, creating duplicates of it uh, and doing that? Um, and the answer is uh, sort, sort of, <laughs> sort of. So, uh, so that's the best answer. Uh, as far as uh, creating more more structure, it's creating more structure, it's creating more uh, physical space, it's going to be out there. So, well, that's, so. that's taking your platform and it's made a column-based structure in the shape you give it. Right, yeah. right. So I can take the same flat file and construct it into a, a different column-based structure, too. So it has taken that data and rearranged it. Yeah. So if we run a map reduce job, if we create a map reduce job manually and put it at the same US airport data and run a page catalog job, we can potentially get different results. So, so. If, if you point it at the same table in H catalog? Well, map reduce went directly to the file system. Right. And we ran a query, a HQL query against it. They're not looking at the same thing. They're looking at it, it, if you run a high query through H catalog, yeah. uh, it's looking at it, the data in terms of, of whatever table structure you have on top of that. If you run a uh, actual map reduced job, yeah. you can run the map reduced job directly into the file if yeah. you wanted yeah. to. Yeah. But there's no there's yeah. nothing yeah. to say. Yeah, the structure uh, is, it would be different. Okay. So, the data so you, is also different as well, right? What's that? The data is well, they're now different things, right? The, the file system, the file itself, and the data in the page catalog are now different things in the separate. Right. Yeah. I see what you're saying. So, yeah, I would say they're, in, in, in that sense, they're separate. Right. Okay. All right, so if you notice, what happened here now is we're going to have the uh, particular uh, airport building. Uh, so here's my airports table. If I want to browse the data, I can actually go in and browse the data. And here it's representing the data again in different uh, columns. All right, so we loaded the data. We actually browse the data here. So now, once we have it loaded, uh, 
we can query it out. So, how am I doing on time here? What's, uh, got uh, another half an hour? Yeah, cool. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to do some uh, Hive uh, QL. So it facilitates uh, querying large data sets again. Uh, SQL query like uh, you can use the command line interface or you can use a, a user interface which uh, beeswax is the only one I really know about out there right now uh, it ends up doing query execution via map reduce remember it's going to convert it into some kind of a map reduce uh, extendable with custom functions so you have uh, different functions here you have UDF functions uh, UDF, UDAF functions and UDTF functions. So uh, user defined function would be something that would uh, take a row uh, in and spit a row out or take a column in and spit a column out. Uh, so that would be something like uh, give me the hour uh, for this particular date. A UDAF is going to be an aggregate so it's going to take multiple inputs and combine them into a single output and a UDTF is a table uh, function so it's going to take a single input and create a table output for that all right so you have all three of those uh, it supports uh, like I said before JDBC and ODBC uh, connectors so basic high queries and this is the beauty of it. So if you guys know uh, SQL, T SQL, PL SQL, you know Hive Query. It's, it's pretty much the same. So here we have select flight data, airport uh, code, delay from flight data where delay is greater than 100. So it's just going to go in there and, and bring those back. Uh, here we're having one where we're going to have an actual aggregate. So these are built in. Uh, aggregate functions and there's quite a few in there so one of the things you want to do is get the uh, uh, you can uh, do a uh, search on Hive QL and it will point you to the Apache uh, manuals for these okay and so uh, count star max delay from flight data uh, group by so you can do grouping by and so forth here is select day of the flight date uh, and then the airport code delay from flight data where the delay is greater than uh, 100. So let's just uh, show you how you can put these in. We should stop doing that. Okay, so to, to get your queries, you're going to go over here to Beeswax. And notice uh, you can connect to the database that you you want to connect to. Uh, so if we look at this, we're going to have the default database. You can define others. I just didn't define any. Uh, if you look at the tables here, you can see the different tables. These are all the tables that I created in H Catalog. So all the tables that I created in H Catalog are going to be uh, brought over and uh, recognized by Hive. So uh, you're going to be able to see those. Uh, and then these are kind of nice. So we have the query editor, so you can do uh, freeform in there. Uh, and then you can have save queries. So if I look at save queries, you'll notice I have a uh, bunch of different uh, save queries in here. And so uh, here's a demo select. So if you notice uh, on this one, I just have select stock symbol, stock price. Uh, so just do a normal select from, from the stocks. Uh, and you can do things like this. One of the things you want to remember is um, that you're going to probably be pulling this from large data sets unless you strip down the data sets uh, into a developer type of data set that you're going to just uh, work with. Uh, so you can also do stuff like limit. So I'm going to say limit 10. 
and then I'm going to execute. And notice what it's doing here. So I executed that, and so it's going to start spitting this stuff out. Uh, what's going on? So a starting job, and The nice thing about this, when you're working in this, is if you're a, a patient personality, it takes a while for these to run. So as the nice thing is, I go for a cup of coffee and I walk around, you know, talk to people when I'm running these jobs, and I'm on the clock, so I'm getting paid for it. So, uh, and people say, "Can't you make it any fast?" No, it's the way. To, <laughs> so, so anyhow, here we are with the uh, results. And if you notice, if we look at the log, uh, you can look at the logs as they're running through there. Uh, so the different logs. And uh, somewhere in here, it'll start uh, launching job one out of one. And as you watch that, it'll actually tell you the map reduce that it's going through. So what percentage of the map produced and all that kind of thing. Okay. The kill? Yeah. Uh, kill. Yeah. Yeah. So you can, uh, you know, yeah, if you get into uh, a long running thing that just you want to just kill it, you know, that's the, the, the thing to send in, just like kill. All right. So let's take a look at. Um, Some of the advanced query you can do then. I'm going to leave it like this so I don't have to <laughs> switch back and forth. Uh, can everybody see this? Still see it? It's fine. Yeah. Uh, so some of the advanced query you can do with Hive, uh, you can do table equal joins, okay? So one of the things you want to remember uh, is you can't do uh, left join, right join, full join stuff. Uh, it's just equal join stuff. Uh, and uh, it's uh, best to uh, put the uh, largest table on the right side. So if you have two tables, one's a smaller table, uh, put the larger table on the right side. It just works out better. Uh, you have XPath. So what's XPath? What's that? Yeah, so you can create uh, uh, you can have one of your columns be an XML column and do an XPath into it. Uh, you can do sampling. So sampling is, is good uh, because, remember, uh, you have all this tremendous amount of data and you might want to just sample some of it. So you can actually just say sample three out of 32 buckets or sample these partitions or whatever. Okay. Uh, there's a bunch of grouping things you can do. You can do cubes and roll-ups, uh, which we're used to. Uh, windmilling and analytics type things, and there's a lot of statistics and data mining type of uh, built-in functions that you can actually use in here. So if I come over, and just to show you an example of one of those, well actually here's some uh, some queries on here, and then I'll run one. Uh, so we have select, uh, in this particular case uh, we're doing a join, so we have uh, different batting, uh, and then um, uh, join uh, runs from batting group by year on year. And notice we're, it's just like we're used to using. So what are your join keys? And uh, the only thing is you can only do uh, equal joins. All right. So uh, of course this is American baseball. I don't know. <laughs> I was trying to watch uh, the cricket. Last night on TV, and I couldn't figure it out for the life of me. So I actually watched for about a half an hour trying to figure it out. I was like, nah, I don't. <laughs> so, all right, so we have uh, here is a uh, table sampling. So in this particular case, we're going to say, okay, uh, do uh, uh, the select from 
three out of the 32 buckets, just give me a sample of what's going on. Randomly sample it. And that's what it is, a random sample. Uh, here we're doing um, group by. Okay, so if you notice here we have the uh, select the month of the date. Uh, we can, and then if you look, here's the column alias, so it's just like you're used to, month, uh, stock symbol, and then the max uh, stock price, and group by. So those are some of the uh, uh, different types of advanced queries you can have. So if I look over and just to show you one that works, let's look at save queries, and do... Okay, so here's one where we do select uh, month uh, and uh, the date, the stock symbol, the max, and then group by month, date, and then stock symbol, and then we're going to do a roll up. And so if I execute that, Take a while. So you were talking, you said before about how you then fill in a table. You know, have a batch and fill in a table. Are, are the tools in there? Are, are these things actually creating a template table, or is it a manual job that you have to do that query and then enter them into a table somewhere else, or can you do an insert into? No, you can do an insert into. Let's. Uh, yeah, if you look, there, there's a. If you have a um, staging tables. Yeah. So you can do your staging tables and do an insert into and another job, okay, and all these can, can be scheduled, so you can do these as scheduling these jobs. So your normal queries. hive query would be something like insert into staging tables, select a lot from your... Uh, it depends on, uh, yeah, it depends on how you're going to do it. If you're going to do it, uh, do it as an actual load when you're doing it, uh, your hive query, you can do it that way. Most likely, most of your querying ta your staging tables are going to be loaded at night or off hours uh, to do this kind of thing. So you're going to be pulling in log files or whatever from another system, pumping those files in, uh, and then doing a uh, update table statement, uh, you know, at night sometime in a script. And then uh, when when you come in and you're going to do uh, some kind of a end user query, so you're going to make querying to, to see the results right now, or querying from a client tool in, uh, then you're going to see, you're going to do this kind of thing. Okay. okay. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's, again, it's kind of getting used to the massive amounts of data type thing, and so you got to make sure you schedule stuff that's going to take a long time, off hours, and then, then uh, set it up so that uh, you can just do these types of uh, queries into, uh, you know, and they, they can run. I mean, it takes a, a little while, but it's not that long of a, of a wait. So if you're going to pull this into uh, Excel or something like that, you know, you, you can write that same high query to pull it into Excel and then run it that one. So you'll notice here we have the, uh, uh, the different... Uh, uh, the max close date for the months, and then the different stock symbols. Here's where you got the roll up part of it. So at the top, so let's roll. All right. So, next thing I wanted to show a little bit about is uh, extending hive queries. Okay, so if for example, you don't have uh, it doesn't you know it built into it. It doesn't have what you want to do. You might have some uh, processing that is just uh, just for you guys. Uh, then what you can do is you have two ways of taking this. You can do a map reduce script, or you can do a UDF. Right, your own roll your own UDF. 
Uh, if you look at the MapReduce scripts, these can be written in Python, Ruby, uh, shell scripts, and R. So I don't know if how many of you know Python. Okay, uh, Python's not too hard to learn. So uh, and actually, most of the scripts that I see out there is, as demos are going to be, or as uh, uh, things that they've done uh, to extend it, are in Python. So it seems to be a uh, uh, good data processing uh, type of language. Uh, so it inputs the values uh, consist of tab delimited strings and the output values come back as tab uh, delimited strings. And then to call the script you just use transform clause in H HQL. So you, you create a script, you end up uh, loading that script up to your uh, HDFS system and then you're going to end up calling the script when you do your HTQL. So I'll share an example of that. UDFs uh, that take a row in, process it, and return the row back. Uh, UDAF, which I talked about this before, performs an aggregation on input values and reduces the number of rows. And the UDTF takes a row in, parses it out uh, into a table. Okay. So these, these uh, if you're going to create these, you would have to do these in, in Java uh, to get that and then have a jar file that is going to end up, uh, you can put the jar file up on your um, HDFS and then once that jar file is there, you can call it from your uh, Hive queries. The nice thing is that there are uh, some of these uh, that are not in there, the people are starting to release some that they've developed. Yahoo's released some uh, queries, uh, statistical queries that I've used, uh, and uh, some other places are, are releasing some of these too. So you're going to see more and more of these uh, kind of released and available. So here's an example of a MapReduce script uh, written in Python. And so uh, in this particular case, uh, you probably can't see that, but for line in, uh, so it's going to take each line in, uh, has, it's going to strip the line, uh, and then it's going to uh, split the line using a tab, and then it's going to calculate the weekday, so to calculate the weekday it's just using a date time functions. Uh, inside of Python date time functions and then it has to put the values back out so it's just a print statement and uh, it's going to end up doing uh, a join uh, for that for user ID in the weekday. Okay so just a processing so you're going to take in uh, a line work with it and then you're going to spit out whatever uh, as a line. The select transform then, you're going to do select transform and then we're going to pass in the user ID and the user date uh, and then using and then whatever the name of the uh, script is, so in this case it's just map script as, as uh, date, uh, user ID and then uh, cluster by date from whatever. So. Uh, you just use the transform clause to end up uh, bringing that in. So if I look at uh, an example of that. Okay, so in this particular case, I have select transform split. Uh, 
So uh, I'm going to split a log entry uh, and then throw it in there and take uh, the, uh, in this case I'm actually combining two things. So uh, the transform, I'm going to basically use this get hour uh, and I'm going to end up uh, getting the hour uh, using my Python script, okay, from whatever I pass in. Now, the uh, so I have this get hour dot pby. The inside here, what I'm doing is actually taking and using a split function on a log entry, so I can pick the uh, third third one. So that's I'm probably doing too much here, but uh, does everybody understand it? So I'm just uh, splitting a log entry, taking to uh, the first, and actually the second uh, column that you get from the split and taking the fourth column that you get from the split and then I'm going to pass those into my Python uh, script and that's going to give me the hour back. All right. Now to do that I did have to load that Python script up in there but it's actually very easy because you just load it like any other file. So in here I have this uh, get hour Python uh, py and here you can see if I if I browse it it's just going to browse like any other uh, text file so here's my line in I'm going to say line dot strip field equal line dot split and then take a look at it uh, get the hour out of it so I'm splitting it by the uh, the colon uh, that's in there and then checking the first one all right, so come back here to my save queries script, execute this. And there you go. So it's going to go in. It took the log level from those uh, log files. And then it split out the hour that it recorded that log level. All right. So I could throw this into a staging table and then do a count by hour or do anything like that. Make sense? All right. Now the last thing I actually don't have a demo for, but I'm just going to uh, uh, talk about. Um, so we have the ODPC driver for Hadoop, and it uses uh, uh, Hive and H HQL to retrieve the data. There are actually several vendors that actually have this. Uh, Microsoft has one, Cladera has one, Hortonworks has one. Uh, there's one put out by uh, R, uh, FR. And then you use it to connect to the, to the client tools. So things you can use to connect uh, to this is like Excel, with Power Pivot, Power View, Tableau, Map R, Quick View. There's all kinds coming out. Uh, so your favorite BI tool it's probably going to be able to hook into uh, a Hadoop uh, cluster and the way it's going to talk to the Hadoop cluster is going to be through Hive. Okay, so when you uh, end up hooking these up, you're going to send Hive queries in, just like we've been doing, and, and then pull the data back and then you can do uh, your modeling or your visualization of whatever it happens to be. All right. Any last questions? Mm -hmm. I might have missed it, but uh, if there's any mapping errors when you're importing data, is it does it show up when you when you do the import when you do the query? So any errors between your 
the table structure the actual data? It'll show you the mapping errors. Uh, if you do a map reduce, uh, it'll show you, uh, it'll say, uh, it'll give you an error. And then it'll give you the log files. So you have to look through the log files to see what the error is. So that's what when you in a query or a map reduce, you, you get the error then, not when you're doing the import process. Oh, you mean when I actually import the data if it couldn't uh, import it? If you define the table structure. Yeah. I'll see, uh, no, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you, you gotta think the other way. <laughs> Any other question? Uh, can you write uh, server side scripts in C sharp? Uh, when you do uh, using C sharp, uh, you mean well, like a C sharp scripting? Um, well, at this point, uh, no. If you want to do a C sharp, you can do map reduce uh, and write the map reduce. Uh, you have to use it uh, using streaming. So there's actually a streaming uh, interface. So it streams the data out. You actually write the map reduce uh, code and then you know, stream it in. So that's more of a not a query type of thing. But a processing type of thing that you do at night, but yeah, you can do it that way. Now the downside there is that you have, to, uh, I should say, you can only do that uh, on the um, uh, HD Insight or the HTTP because it's running, it has to run on a Windows server then. So uh, for the Linux base, uh, some people have been uh, fooling around with Mono and it seems to be working. So if you wanted to do something like that, you could. But that goes actually a little bit level deeper if you're going to do C sharp, a little bit level deeper than the HQL. Okay, if you're going to write something that's going to be used by HQL, as far as the uh, custom map reduce, uh, your best bet is to just hack, you know, go and write it in a, in a Java uh, and have a jar file with a jar file. Which really, I mean, if you know C sharp. Because everything, uh, even the Microsoft running on a Microsoft uh, server, it's really just a wrapper around uh, the Hadoop instance. With, they didn't make uh, change any of the drawer files. Okay. I think one of the things you, you want to uh, get from this is the fact that there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, power to this, the HQL. So there's a lot of things you can do with HQL. It's not that hard to pick up because it's a querying language. You're used to querying languages. And uh, it's definitely coming. So you're definitely going to have to uh, start combining some of the uh, Hadoop uh, data sources for your analysis with your traditional relational data uh, warehouses in order to, to bring this together. Even if it's only to take and load a data warehouse uh, that you're using, uh, using analysis service or something like that, you're going to have to probably issue some high queries to load that into a dimension or something like that. All right? And uh, one plug. <laughs> so this is, uh, I just released Microsoft Big Data Solutions, uh, put out by uh, uh, a bunch of authors, and one of them is me. Uh, so uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about this stuff, you can go out and look at uh, the Big Data Solutions and how, in particular, uh, Microsoft Technologies is going to be pulling all this together. All right. And that's it. So thanks for coming. I hope you guys learned something.